And hello, everybody, and welcome to the Movie Pit Podcast. Oh, it is. It feels really good to say that again for 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 a while. I haven't done it in a while. So, hello, welcome to the Movie Pit Podcast. I, of course, am your host, Christian. Uh, it has been, like I mentioned, a very long time since I've done this, but it's about it's been six months, about six months, give or take. Um, since the last podcast that I did, and um, I do want to come back, and I want to explain, at least the first part of this podcast, explain uh, where I've been and what's what happened and and what's gonna happen uh, from this point forward with the podcast, because uh, it, the podcast was a big part of my life for about a year and a half, and then you know all of a sudden I just stopped doing it. And I want to explain why I stopped doing it. I never actually gave you guys an explanation of why I stopped doing it. So, um, one of the reasons... And of course, this, as you can see from the title of this podcast, it is going to be a ba- basically a best of, worst of uh, movies of 2018. Like I mentioned before, I wanted to do that. I wanted to get into why I've been gone for so long. And um, and yeah, I want, just want, I just, yeah, I just want to do that. So... Uh, why did I stop doing the podcast? Well, for a little bit, it was, it was just going to be a break. That's all it was. It was, I was going to take a break from the podcast. I wasn't going to, uh, record for a little while. I had plans on coming back, um, around December or even around this time. Uh, and mainly the, the real, the, the real main reason is because, uh, I got a new job and, uh, that job ended up taking a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, my free time that I had. Uh, before, so that's what happened. That that's one of the re- that's one of the things that happened. I I got I got, I got a new job and, and and that's pretty much what it was. But even before that, even before I got the new job, uh, there were some things that I wanted to change about the podcast. Um, first and foremost, uh, I wanted the structure to be a little differently, or be a little different. Uh, I should say. Uh, for one, I wanted more people on the podcast, but uh, that was always going to be a scheduling thing and stuff like that. So I'm going to be honest, when I took the break and when the new year started, obviously this new year started, I had fully intended, and this was back in uh, like November or October when I thought about this, uh, I was going to end the podcast. I wasn't going to come back. I wasn't going to uh, record anything. I, I in, in fact, I was... You know, if you're listening to this only on YouTube, because right, the podcast was on iTunes. It's going to go back to iTunes, but right now it's going to stay on YouTube for a good chunk of time. For a good chunk of time. Um, but uh, I wasn't going to come back. I wasn't going to focus on doing actual videos on YouTube. Basically what I do with the podcast, but just put it in a video format. Uh, I may still do that, but that's going to be way later down the line. Um... I was going to quit, and one of the reasons was uh, that the podcast that I envisioned when I first started it, way back when, even before I actually started recording podcasts and putting them out, uh, was different. I had envisioned something completely different, and it was way ambitious, more ambitious than I possibly could have imagined, and it was more ambitious that, that I can actually do. It was something that... In my head, I was like, "Yeah, I can do that. I can do that." And then when I actually like sat down and logistically and analytically, and it, I can't even say the word now. But when I just sat down and I thought about everything and and how I can uh, format everything and how I can you know record everything, I just couldn't do it. Uh, I overreached in my head and it hurt me just a little bit. I was proud of what I was putting out. I mean, it could have been better. Yes, of course, anything can be better, especially when you're doing a podcast. But I liked what I was doing. Uh, at the time, and even though I had some, even though I had to give up on a lot of things that I had envisioned for the podcast that I thought could really work and could be a lot of fun, uh, I had to basically just tone down everything and create the podcast that you guys all know. Uh, of course, the other thing, like I mentioned briefly, was no co hosts. That was probably my biggest regret of doing the podcast. Uh, for as long as I have, I mean, I've had people on the podcast and I, I fully thank all those people who have been on the podcast. If you're listening, thank you very much. Um, and a lot of that was again, my fault 
arguably all of my fault. Um, I remember when I first discussed the basically the idea of the podcast. I had two people willing to jump in with me, and they were a full. They were they were like you know just tell us tell us when you're gonna start recording, and we'll be there. And I never got back to them because in my head I was still figuring everything out on how I was going to do the podcast. I've had one of them actually be a co-host on the podcast, which was a lot, or a guest on the podcast, which was a lot of fun. Um, I, and I, I look back at it, I've only had eight co-hosts and slash guests, whatever you want to call them, on the podcast. Um, and four of those actually came from the Summer Movie Season Preview Podcasts. Uh, which is probably at at least right now, or at least back then, and will be for the foreseeable future as as long as I do the podcast, will be the biggest podcasts that we have here on the podcast. Podcast, podcast. Um, I don't know why I worded it that way. That was weird. Anyway, look, I know, and I've mentioned this multiple times when I was recording back then. A one person podcast can be boring and not as engaging as having. A several person podcast or even having one other person on the podcast believe me i know i edit the podcast myself i don't have a team behind me i'm editing this by myself and putting it out publishing it by myself and stuff like that so and i'm not a well-known person no one knows who the hell i am i i'm posted up on my social media and it's really up to anyone who follows me or is friends with me to be like, hey, go check out this podcast. And I, and part of me is like, you know, I want to go out there and tell them, you know, hey, you know, spread the word out. And then, I, but then I, I, I just feel like I'm becoming that annoying podcast. But like, hey, you want to listen to my podcast? I just, I don't want to be that person. But anyway, uh, moving on from that, uh, the last bit of why I was going to quit and why I wasn't going to do the podcast anymore was... As much fun as it is doing a podcast and putting my voice out there, uh, and that was the other reason why I wanted someone else with me on the podcast, because just hearing, even if our opinions are the same, the reasons why we probably like or dislike a a movie news item or a movie is going to be probably different. Um, That's Having a movie podcast is always, again, it's always more engaging, or having any podcast uh, is always more engaging when there's more than one person. Um, But... The last reason that I was going to potentially quit the podcast was, or in the podcast, because it is my podcast, um, was it was all work and no play. And like I mentioned, I, you know, I'm not a well-known person, you know, I don't, you know, the, I have, you know, I see how, how, how many people actually listen to the podcast, or how many people maybe even started listening to the podcast, maybe didn't finish all the way, um, but... It's all play for me. It was all play. For, it was all. It was all work for me. I should say. Uh, you know, I wrote. You know, what the Facebook page, uh, with the Twitter page that you know I made, but don't constantly always update, and that's my fault. Um, you know, I was putting movie news stories up. I was putting movie reviews up. I was putting the podcast out, and it just wasn't enough engagement. And I get that, you know, it, the podcasts have always tended to be very long. I always try to shorten them down. Um, you know, I think the hour is a nice buffer, but once they get past an hour, it's just it gets a little too much. But I was putting everything out there, and there was no engagement. And that's fine. Like I mentioned, I'm not a well-known person, so I'm not expecting, you know, dozen, dozens of people to be like, oh, this is what I think, this is what I think. It, it just, for me, it was all work and no play. It was just, that's kind of what it was. But I've enjoyed doing the podcast, and I, I was going to quit, and then, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was just being away from for so long. Maybe I just needed a recharge, and that's pretty much what it was. So, I'm back. Um, I'm not going to say that it's going to be a weekly podcast like it has been in the past. It will probably be like a bi-weekly podcast, or maybe even... Um, um, longer than that. So, uh, the podcast is back. It's not back fully entirely like it was. So, um, one of the main things that I want to change this year for the podcast is I want to have people on. And that's going to be a big proponent of whether there's a podcast that week or not. I'm going to be honest. Uh, I was supposed to have uh, some guests on the podcast this week. And something came up with both of them, and, that was, and that's fine. You know, stuff happens. Uh, I will have a pre-recorded message 
uh, from one of the guests that was on the podcast. He's actually been on the podcast before. Um, so he, you'll hear his voice, not just my voice the whole time. Uh, so I'm going to edit that in uh, once I get done with my little opening spiel here. Uh, and you'll hear his opinion, and then you'll hear my opinions on the movies. But, um, but yeah, I've... Uh, I I have I've I've had a good break for the podcast and I think that kind of reinvigorated me and and wanting to come back and do the podcast even more. So uh, the podcast is back. It's not again entirely back because it's not going to be a weekly podcast unless something big. Really, unless there are some really huge movie news items that come out every week, then I'm going to come on to the po- do the podcast. Even if it's like a half hour podcast, I'll probably do that. Um, I'm going to try to make the podcast shorter, because I know they always tend to be long. This one might be a little long because it's a best of, worst of, uh, of the year. But, um, yeah, you're going to hear me. You're going to hear someone else. I'm going to always try to have someone else on the podcast with me. That's going to be one of my new rules for the podcast this year. Um, and it's just going to be more engaging, hopefully. Hopefully more engaging. And, and that, of course works only if you guys help me out too so um yeah that's that's my little opening spiel of what was going on with the podcast what's going to go on with the podcast there's gonna be a lot more bigger podcasts this year at least that's the hope um i'm finally going to do something near the end of the year that i've been wanting to do since i started the podcast and i haven't done it yet but uh of course that will uh that will be revealed in time Obviously, it's just the beginning of the new year. And that being said, hopefully all you guys had a very good, safe, happy new year and holidays. Uh, It's a new year. It's a brand new year of movies. And what better way to start the brand new year than talking about the movies of last year, I guess. So, yeah, that's what this podcast is going to be. So, the podcast this week is going to be a podcast of uh, the movies of last year. It is going to be a best of slash favorite of worst disappointments surprises uh, of the year for me. And like I mentioned, I was supposed to have guests on the podcast this week. Uh, he, my good friend uh, Mike, couldn't come on unfortunately on the podcast, but he actually recorded something to put into the podcast. So I'm going to edit in his opinions on the uh, about the movies right here, and then after that. Uh, I'm going to jump in and talk about my stuff. So uh, here you go. All right, guys, I'm going to try and keep this nice and tight. My name is Mike. Uh, I'm going to give you my top movies of 2018, my worst movies of 2018, and my biggest disappointments of 2018. Uh, The biggest disappointments I had this year in film were Sicario, Dan Soldado. I thought, man, this movie started off great, but it really kind of falls off in the second half. All the... All of the first was so great, and it really kind of carried over, and there were so many great moments. And Benicio Del Toro and Josh Brolin do such a great job in in these movies. But the way that it ends, it kind of just loses so much steam, and I really felt myself sitting back in my chair watching it. Uh, Solo, a Star Wars story, just if I walk out of a theater and I, I just feel meh, and not really remember a whole lot. I, I was also a big proponent that that movie never should have been made. I think that it was a cash grab. I think only Harrison Ford should play that role because when it's such a beloved character, if someone else steps in, it pulls some of the mystery and the magic out of that character. And there's a lot of stuff that should have just remained a mystery. Um, Deadpool 2. I was surprised that I was going to put this on the list, but... Um, I don't know. I just I love Ryan Reynolds in that role. I love so much about it, but it didn't click for me this time. I think a lot of the first one succeeded because it was so different than what we'd seen before, um, and I think that it, w- it was hard to live up to those expectations going into a sequel. I thought it was funny. I thought some of the jokes didn't land as well. I thought some of them were a little forced. The action was great, of course, um, but. I don't know. It just it the pieces were there. Zazzy beats. Josh Brolin was great as Cable. I mean, I, I just it didn't work for me. Uh, my biggest disappointment of 2018 is a heartbreaker for young Mike. Uh, Incredibles two. Everything about that movie made me sad because I wanted it to be so much better than it was. Um, 
It wasn't bad. A similar thing with Solo. It just was meh. I think the story... They had so much time to get the story right. And I I think they picked a direction and just kind of didn't deviate from it at any point to consider something else. Um, and I love that the cast is back. Hearing their voices is just an amazing, goosebump-inducing feeling. But Frozone and all the great stuff from the first. But it just kind of feels like a rehash of a lot of things. Um, I wish it was better. Now on to my worst movies of 2018. So there's two, uh, there's two that I want to mention that I didn't even see specifically because of the trailers. And I'm going to say Welcome to Marwin and Holmes and Watson should be on everyone's list even if you didn't see them. The Welcome to Mar- Marwin trailer looked like a parody trailer for an Oscar, Oscar bait film. Like it should have been at the beginning of Tropic Thunder, that much of a parody. And uh, Holmes and Watson, if they're not doing comedies with... with Adam McKay. I don't. I don't really think I'm gonna be checking those guys' stuff out anymore, and that hurts because I love them both very, very much. Um, Twelve strong. Uh, I couldn't take it seriously when the horses fought the tanks. You you lose every time. I don't care how fast your horse is. Tank will kill your horse and you as well. You're gonna lose. Thor and. Michael Shannon, General Zod couldn't couldn't really save it. I loved it when I saw it drunk. I'll tell you that. But <laughs> other than that, um, blo- blockers, just uh, just real rough stuff. I mean, it felt like the three of them were doing of Cena, Eric Berenholtz, and Leslie Mann, who I all think are very funny. Um, I think they were all just doing their own. Stand-up specials that were running concurrently, it's really what it felt like to me. Um, so it just didn't click for me at all. Um, Jurassic World 2, <laughs> Fallen Kingdom, oh my god, was that awful. These movies are total nostalgia baiting. And the first one I could kind of, I really enjoyed because it brought me right back to watching that movie on repeat when I was younger and how much I loved the, just the absolute spectacle and incredible visual and, ma- and and fantasy of this this potential world and everything about it and how cool Alan Grant was and Ian Malcolm and uh, Jurassic World was just kind of like well, you remember remember do you remember all the cool stuff you liked well this one was like do you remember the lost world and let's just do it worse and make you hate these movies so there's that 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 and and The absolute worst movie of 2018 is based off a video game I played at Pizza Hut when I was a kid in an arcade. Is Rampage. That movie is such a piece of shit. It is so bad. I didn't even watch it with consent. I was on a couch and somebody had it on so loud that I couldn't continue reading. And I didn't want to get up because of principle. So I watched this stupid fucking movie and how bad... It was. Every time The Rock is in a movie, it doesn't matter. He's like, well, I'm a cashier. But 10 years ago, <laughs> I was in the Special Forces. What do you do? I, I'm, I work at a veterinarian's office. I take the, I take the kittens in back and I, and I pet them. But 10 years ago, I was in the Special Forces. Every single character he plays is like, I used to be a badass, but now I'm trying to be normal, so leave me alone. Oh, here are circumstances that make me be a badass again. Uh, this Just the flying wolf, the ridiculousness, the villains, Malin Ackerman, and the, the crappy Jim from The Office, the guy that steals Aaron from Andy. They just, it's just so campy. Jeffrey Dean Morgan, who I normally like, is doing a shitty version of Negan. Uh, <laughs> I just I can't I can't the gator at J- uh, f- the, the, the wolf when it kills Manganello like Joe Manganello and them in the woods I, there let's have one thing t- on the tower on the Sears tower just bring them all here they hate it so much they're tear it down I don't understand the logic of the movie and the worst part about the whole thing is the end when spoiler alert the gorilla dies. George dies, but he's faking it to freak out the rock. He wakes up, like, because he sees him peeking. Giant gorilla. And he flicks him off. 
How is this a movie? How? Who? Why? I get The Rock makes billions of dollars just if he farts on screen. But just come on, have a little bit of a little bit of art, artistic integrity. Jesus Christ. All right. This top list is going to be tough. There's some honorable mentions. Um, I think that Mission Impossible Fallout was really cool. I really liked it. Henry Cavill was great. I don't like Tom Cruise as a person, but I think he does a really good job in these movies. Um, uh, what else? A Quiet Place? I really liked it a lot. Um, I think that it's hard to not like John Krasinski, but it's also hard to not see him as Jim Halpert. So he was able to pull that off and make it a believable role. And Emily Blunt is great. I just really like the concept of the film, and I think they executed it very well. Um, Eighth Grade, the film from Bo Burnham, I think that was a really great look at what it's like to be a kid. Um, I absolutely loved that movie. I think it did a wonderful job of portraying the awkwardness of youth uh, and puberty and being a kid and trying to fit in and figure out who you are as you grow up. I think that was a great, great, great film. Um, First Man, I think in a little while we'll regard it as a better movie than what it's been seen so far. Uh, Ryan Gosling does an amazing job and um, it's just a beautiful film from top to bottom. I think it's really great. Um, and it's celebratory, but not in a masturbatory sense of that accomplishment, which is, I think, the right way to look at it. Um, what else? What else? What else? Oh, Black Klansman. Absolutely great. John David Washington. Um, uh, Ky- fucking Kylo Ren. Adam Driver. <laughs> There are so many great people in that movie. Uh, Topher Grace as David Duke. Oh, my God. That movie was so great. Spike Lee did such a great job with that movie. It was so timely, um, but yet fit the era. I think think we're looking at a potential superstar in John David Washington, Denzel's son. He was so great in that movie. And Adam Driver, he could read the phone book. And make it interesting. Um, my top two, I, I well, next is Black Panther. Um, there, there is definitely a Marvel formula in place with this movie, but it manages to do what a lot of the great Marvel films, like Guardians of the Galaxy and Thor Ragnarok and, and Captain America: The First Avenger, were able to do. And there's more, but have a voice of its own within while well, fitting in that and making a statement about something or, or striving to make people feel a certain way. Um, I, I think that it's grown past what it what it's 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 performed better than what its potential allowed it. Where it's become more than just a movie, but as a movie itself I think it's very, very good. The performances are great. Mbaku is a runaway star of the movie um, to the point where now he's in the uh, his new um, Jordan Peele horror movie, Us. Um, oh, and Lupita Nyong'o, I believe, too. Um, just so many great performances in that movie. Uh, Andy Serkis is Claw. I wish he was around more. He was great. There... There were so many cool moments, and it was tough because I felt like Chadwick Boseman kind of got muffled by all of the great performances around him. But it's it's sad because he does such a great job in that role, and up against Michael B. Jordan too, it, just perfectly executed, perfectly well done. It does fit the formula where the guy, the villains, get the same exact power set and basically the same situation as the as the hero. You know, we we've, we've seen it in a bunch of these movies, but when when that's the only negative, you know that the movie was just a, a knockdown, drag out, awesome. And I I've seen it multiple times, and I can I can sit down and watch it again. Uh, finally, I I feel like if I waited a day, Spider Verse probably will be at the top, but for me, it's 
<clears throat> Avengers Infinity War. This has been a culmination. I mean, what can you say about it? The Russo brothers took over for Joss Whedon, and, and I think it was the perfect scenario for these films. Um, when you're able to balance so many characters and keep their voices and, and keep... I thought that there was a, there was a possibility that this was going to be the first truly bad Marvel film. Because for the same reason that I thought Deadpool 2 f- suffered, I thought that the 10 years of films leading up to this would make any performance by this. There's no way that this movie could be as good as it, everyone was going to make it out to be in their heads. And I think that it was able to do that and more because I don't think people realized how much of an Empire Strikes Back, even worse than Empire Strikes Back, uh and this was going to have. And the I've never been in a theater for a movie where I had... I mean, this, this film had the loudest I've ever heard a crowd cheer. And then, I think it's like four minutes later, the quietest, deafening silence I've ever experienced in a movie theater or anything. The, you could hear people's internal digestion it was so quiet in there Be- when when the snap happened it was it was eerie and it just added to the gut punch it really really sets up avengers endgame and and <laughs> there are so many cool moments in that film and performances thor gets his uh his his great moments to shine. I just hope that we get to see um, Captain America get his coming up in in Endgame. But uh, those are those are my uh, twenty eighteen movies. Uh, hopefully, I get you guys get to hear from me in the future. Um, and uh, go see some go go watch more movies. Don't just look at the memes for Bird Box. <laughs> go actually check some movies out. There's some that I haven't even seen, and I'm disappointed in myself. So go check them out. Uh, enjoy. Enjoy 2019. Happy New Year, everybody. All right. Thank you, Mike, for that. And uh, let's get to my stuff. So uh, it's it's uh, it's going to be a little, really, obviously, really structured uh, going about that. So let's talk about, uh, let, you know what, let's start off with the disappointments of the year for me. Uh, because it's, it's always fun to talk about the worst stuff first. I guess, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but before that, I want to mention my undecided movies of the year. Now, the Undecided Movies of the Year uh, is a new category that I made for myself. It's basically movies that I watched, and I don't know how I feel about them. They're not... It, it, they, they're in this weird middle ground where they can be on any part, of, any part of the lists, but for whatever reason, there was just something about them that stopped me from putting on them. It's different from the Just Missed the List, but it, it's just... Yeah, I don't know. There's The very divisive movies of the year. Let's put it that way. That's, that's probably what... That's probably a better name for it. Uh, so I'll, it's the divisive movies of the year list. Let's put it that way. Uh, so every, oh, by the way, all the movies that I'm going to rattle off are going to be in alphabetical order, just because it's a little more easier that way, um, and I don't have to pick like a certain favorite or I'll feel like I'm picking one particular movie out, even though that's essentially kind of what I'm doing in some cases. And I will let you know what obviously is my worst movie of the year. Uh, for this list, but when it comes to the best and the favorite movies, it's just going to be all alphabetical order. So my divisive, I'll just put divisive, 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 divisive uh, movies of the year for 2018 are Assassination Nation, Hotel Artemis, Mandy, Solo, A Star Wars Story, Suspiria, The Strangers Pray at Night, Tully, Unsane, and Venom. And those are my undecided or my div- divisive, divisive however you want to pronounce it, uh, movies of the year. Uh, so let's move on to my dishonorable mentions, movies that were not good, but uh, was still deserve a mention. Breaking In, which was the Gabrielle Union movie that came out earlier this year. Hellfest, which I knew was not going to be good, but I went to go watch it anyway. Uh, did not like it, but did not like it enough to put it on my disappointments, least liked Worst movies of the year list. And the 1517 The Paris, which was the Clint Eastwood movie about the real-life incident. And it's not that the movie was 
I think I don't think the movie was bad per se. I think I I think the idea of having non actors play themselves in an event in a movie based on an event that took like five minutes in real life was probably not the best thing. Uh, the movie's not it's not entirely bad, but once you know that that the main actors in the movie are the real people that were involved in that event and they're playing themselves leading up to that event and they're not actors and for the most part I mean they did pretty good but there's just these moments in the movie that are very like they're just nothing scenes and you're just like why is this scene in here why why am I watching these people order food at a restaurant in Venice that's literally a scene in the movie all they, that that's all the scene is they meet some random chick and they go to a restaurant and they're ordering food and the scene's like three minutes long and I don't know why it's in the movie. I honestly don't. Nothing happens. Nothing comes of it. Nothing happens in the scene. That's all the scene is. I don't, I don't know. Alright. So let's move on to the big list. The disappointments, least liked movies, uh, worst movies of the year. You suck! Death Wish. It's a re- okay, obviously a remake of the cult classic movie with Charles Bronson. Bruce Willis is in the movie. I don't know. I just... it it I, It felt like... It was a little tone death because this is a movie that was moved around from release schedule to release uh, to release date to release date, um, mainly because it was supposed to come out uh, not 2018 but 2017, and for whatever reason it got pushed back uh, because I don't know if they, just, they wanted to move it or they just wanted to move it away or whatever, and then it got moved around again, and then it finally came out early this year. I believe uh, it was March. I think it came out in March. It was supposed to. It was supposed to come out like in the beginning of the March, and then it moved back to the middle of March, something like that. I don't. I don't know. But it got moved around a lot, and one of, one of the reasons it got moved around the last time that it got moved was because of uh, the mass shootings that were going around. So it's a little tone death in its sub in its message of, hey, vigilantism is okay, kind of, maybe we don't know. So that's kind of what it was. But it, it, despite that message. The movie wasn't even that good. There, were, there was very tonal whiplashes most of the time. And a lot of it came from the cops in the movie. One of the cops in the movie is actually played by Dean Norris. Because of course it is. But uh, I don't know. It just it's, it just wasn't good. Let's put it that way. It just wasn't good. Um, my next movie is Proud Mary. That came out um, around this time. It was actually one of the first movies to come out in the new year of 2018. And I, I think Proud Mary had a lot of potential. I think it was trying to be kind of a throwback to the black exploitation movies of the past. Tahari P. Henson, who was the 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 lead in the movie, plays uh, Mary in the movie, um, and I think she does okay for, for what she's given for the most part. But the whole movie itself just it it feels like it it never actually picked up anything, and it felt like it there was a lot there was some potential there, just it just didn't go anywhere. The next movie is Slender Man. Oh, Slender Man, what happened? And this is one of those moments where I'm, I, I, I wanted to have the podcast because I wanted to talk about this movie. Slender Man, obviously, many, many years too late for its own good. Uh, but one of the things that happened with Slender Man, and I believe we actually managed to talk about this before I took my break on the podcast, was that the producers of the movie had some creative differences with the studio about how to handle the movie and market the movie. So the producers of the movie wanted to like really ump the ante and, and, and have it, you know, be like this full blown like horror movie. And I think the studio was like, no, no, we're just going to market it to like the teeny boppers. And this led to the studio, which was Sony pictures, by the way, not only moving the movie around the release schedule on several occasions, but apparently cutting several key scenes, leaving a movie, uh, leaving the movie, I should say, a very noticeable mess. I watched the movie, and uh, unfortunately, I watched the movie because that movie is a mess. There are there are things that happen that don't go anywhere. There's a character uh, in the. If you watch the trailers and you watch the movie, you know there are key scenes missing. And one of those key scenes involves one of the three main characters, and she just disappears from the movie with no mention whatsoever. None. Nothing. She just, poof, she's gone. Um, they didn't even, like, go back and, like, do reshoots or anything like that. She was just, she was, she was gone. No one, no one even talked about her. So, and the thing with Slender Man is, like, it, it probably had potential to be a good movie, even though it was many years too late, it probably had some potential of being one of those movies that maybe didn't find an audience 
uh, when it first comes out, when it first came out, but it could find an audience later on. I don't think that's going to be the case. It's a weak script. Uh, the characters aren't really that interesting. Uh, the main character isn't that interesting. One of the probably, if I had to pick an interesting character, it's a character that's a supporting character played by Joey King, uh, who unfortunately, uh, even even her um, being kind of, I mean, she's probably a, a staple now in horror movies because she's done a big uh, handful of them already. Um, she couldn't even save this movie. So it's just, I don't know, it's just, it lacked any real substance to make it a worthwhile movie. So yeah, that's, it, it was bad. It wasn't, it wasn't my worst movie of the year because my worst movie of the year is The Happy Time Murders. I am, gl- I, I am proud to say that is my worst movie of the year. Um, or maybe not proud because I actually went to go see it. But The Happy Time Murders... I'll admit the concept that, you know, puppets, you know, live in the real world or whatever, and it's, it's, it's okay. I didn't mind the concept that the concept maybe, maybe could be interesting, but the movie itself was just so bad. Like, I, I couldn't blame the critics and the fans saying this movie was bad because I, and, but I didn't expect much from the Happy Time Murders either. I just want to, I just want to make that clear. It wasn't really funny it was cringeworthy at times and there were just moments where i was just like why am i still here why is this movie still why is this movie still running and it has nothing to do with melissa mccarthy i know a lot of people out there are bash melissa mccarthy because she does all these comedy movies and, and stuff like that and people just like to to rag on her because you know it's easy to rag on her no it was not, it's not her fault it's the script's fault the script is not funny it's not good and there's just, just really dumb moments for the sake of being dumb. And those dumb moments for the sake of being dumb are made even dumber because they don't go anywhere. It's just, it's not a good movie. I have nothing, nothing positive to say about the Happy Time Murders. Nothing. It's the worst movie of the year for 2018. And then my last movie that I have over here, because like I mentioned, I'm going in alphabetical order, uh, is uh, Blumhouse's Truth or Dare. Now, Blumhouse obviously has a very good track record with their horror movies and their thriller movies, and even managed to surprise a lot of us by having Happy Death Day not be terrible. And I'll be honest, I actually am kind of looking forward toward Happy Death Day to you. Uh, But with that said, uh, Truth or Dare had some potential with a good lead-in with Happy Death Day, but sadly, it it, it just wasn't, it wasn't that great. The characters are not great. It loses a lot of steam most of the time after it builds something up. And that's not something you want from your movie, to build something up, build something up, and build a movie up, and then just, nope, nope, we're just going to stop it right there. Just got to let all the steam that we build up and just going to let it all into the atmosphere. No, you don't want that. And then, of course, the effect of uh, the demon. It's a demon in the movie. It's not, it's, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say, it's a demon in the movie that makes people do that dumb snap, uh, Snapchat filter face. It's just dumb. And there's one character that stands out in this movie. Um, and he's played by Hayden uh, Zitto. I think that's how you say his name. He plays Brad in the movie. If you know him, if you watch the movie or you want to watch the movie eventually, he plays Brad. And he's probably the best character in the movie in the storyline. His storyline doesn't actually belong in the movie. But for whatever reason, they make it a point to be in the movie at some point. And it just, it, it's just... It's, it's, it's a wasted good storyline in a movie like this because it's it the movie's not good so just they just waste the storyline and the character because he disappears for a little bit he's not like involved with like the main characters for a while he just disappears and then he comes back and it's like oh we, yeah we forgot about him and we're gonna waste his good stuff it's just it's really dumb anyway and then the ending the endings the ending by the way has been done multiple times in other horror movies and it, it, it's the same, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to spoil it, right? I'm not going to spoil the actual ending, but I'm going to spoil it if you've seen this other movie I'm going to compare it to. If you saw Rings from two years ago, the third Ring movie, if you saw Rings, it's essentially the same ending. And the ending is just really dumb. Because we see how it actually, as opposed to Rings, we don't see what happens uh, when that ending actually occurs, but we see it here in Truth or Dare. It's just really dumb. I didn't like it. And the worst part is I actually heard people in my screening of the movie when the movie was done saying, man, that movie was good. And I just wanted to walk over to them and tell them why. 
Why did you say that? Because it's not it's not a good movie. All right. So that is my disappointments, least liked and worst movie. I'm just gonna say worst movie because there is a worst movie of the year list. Let's move forward because that's the only thing we can do at this moment. Uh, with my uh, my big list, the 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 big list, of course, my best slash favorite movies of the year. And before I get to that, these are the movies that I missed that I wanted to watch that probably could have ended up on a certain list. And they range all over the place. They range from, uh, some, there's some documentaries on here. I think there's only one documentary on here. No, there's two. Uh, there's two documentaries on here. Uh, so the movies that I missed that I wanted to watch this year were Thoroughbreds, uh, Love, Simon. Yes, I actually wanted to watch Love, Simon. I was not expecting to actually wanting to watch Love, Simon, but I saw the trailers and they were really good. I know it's playing on like on the on the movie channels, I don't know if it's like uh, Cinemax or Stars or something, or HBO or Showtime, it's on one of those, um, so I'm going to try to watch it, because I actually was looking forward to it, uh, Wish You Were Here, which was the, the Joaquin Phoenix movie that everyone was talking about, Won't You Be My Neighbor, which was of course the, the documentary about uh, Mr. Rogers, Blind Spotting, uh, Three Identical Strangers, You Were, um, oh, I put, um, you were never really here twice. Um, <laughs> the Death of Stalin, uh, Private Life, which was an uh, indie movie with Katherine Hahn in it. Uh, Revenge, which I was not really wanting to watch, but then I heard some people that I trust say it was actually pretty good, so I wanted to put it on the list. Uh, Wildlife, which was the movie, uh, which was actually pa- uh, Paul Dano's directorial debut, which I really wanted to watch, and I heard, I heard some good things about it. And the other Nicolas Cage movie that I probably should have watched instead of Mandy, uh, Mom and Dad, uh, which I wanted. So that, I believe, came out south... Uh, that was probably Fantastic Fest. But, uh, yeah, those are the movies that I missed that I wanted to watch. Disappointed that I get, get to watch those. So, just wanted to give a little shout-out to those. Uh, the movies that just missed the list... For uh, honorable mention and best slash favorite movies of the year, uh, Blockers. Yes, I actually relatively enjoy Blockers. I thought it was actually pretty funny. Uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me, which was the Melissa McCarthy movie uh, where she plays um, uh, an author who started forging letters of other authors. She was very good in that. Very, very good in that. Uh, Green Book. Halloween. Uh, I was really... Not saying that I did not like Halloween, because I really did like Halloween, but... In terms of all the other movies that, that were on this list, I had to, to make the cut. Uh, Incredibles 2, Ocean's 8, uh, Operation Red Sea, which was a, a foreign movie that I really, really enjoyed. Uh, Overlord, Paddington 2, uh, Ready Player 1, and Tag. Yes, I really liked Tag. I thought Tag was really funny. Except that one joke, which I know everyone's going to talk about. That one joke, but uh, I actually relatively liked Tag. So I want to do my surprises of the year. I keep jumping around. I'm sorry about that. I've, I have put it. I really have it structured right here in my list in front of me. So I apologize for that. Uh, I will get to it eventually. I promise. But first off, let's do some surprises of the year. Uh, again, they're all going to be in alphabetical order. Uh, Den of Thieves. This movie came back uh, or came out, I should say, all the way back in January, and it would it could easily be a very forgettable action thriller, and maybe it is for some people. But Den of Thieves for me uh, was actually really decent. I, I actually walked out really liking it more than I thought I would. And for those who don't remember, Den of Thieves uh, starred uh, Gerard Butler. He's the lead of a uh, of a sheriff's department who's tracking down uh, some successful bank robber, uh, successful bank robber and crew uh, who want to who their next job or their next job I should say, not who their next job. Their next job is to rob the Federal Reserve. And, uh, bro, I don't know, I just, I just really liked it. I don't know what it was. Uh, Pablo Schreiber's in the movie, so is O'Shea Jackson Jr., and they both steal the show. They're part of the, the robbery crew. Uh, and the final, the final act in the movie is really action-packed. So, I don't know, I just, I, I don't know, I, I, I wasn't expecting much of it, and then I saw it, I'm like, you know what? I actually really like this movie, so... Den of Thieves, surprise number one of the year. Uh, Instant Family was my other surprise of the year. It's the one with Mark Wahlberg and Rose Byrne, who play a married couple who uh, end up adopting three children, one of them played by Isabella Moner. This could have easily been just one of those comedies that flew under the radar and just everyone forgot about. But it, it's... It, it, and they probably could have saw the message of, hey, the adopting kids makes your life a living hell. Um... And that could have easily been the case, but it wasn't. 
the director of the movie, Sean Anders, this is kind of based a little bit off his story because he actually recently adopted, uh, or not recently, but at the time of directing this movie, uh, adopted himself. He actually adopted some kids. And this movie is actually kind of based a little bit on his experience and his story. And the movie has a lot of heart. It's genuinely funny. It, it, there's no forced jokes in the movie. It's generally it's genuinely funny. Uh, it has some great character moments and just great moments overall. It's a very touching story. It gets really real at some time at some points, and it's not something that you expect when you're watching the movie because it just hits you with joke after joke after joke and then all of a sudden there's this really serious scene and you're just you're just glued to it and I just I don't know what it was like it was a movie that I was ready to write off um but it's really it's a really uh heart touching funny movie with a lot of heart and I if you haven't watched it uh I actually do highly recommend Instant Family I was not ready to watch that movie at all and I walked down and I genuinely genuinely liked it uh, so my next surprise of the year is Overboard, which was a remake of, of course, the the movie starring uh, Kurt Russell and, and Goldie Hawn, which was, of course, the movie where they met and got married. It's the same concept. It obviously switches the genders because in this movie, it's the guy who gets his memory um, kind of wiped out. Uh, the guy in the movie is played by Eugenio, uh, Eugenio Dubrez, who, of course... Um, is one of the big Mexican superstars who is transitioning over here to America, and of course, uh, the female in the movie is played by um, Ada Ferris. It's uh, I, I wasn't again, I was not expecting a lot of Overboard, and and I ended up really liking it. I don't know what it was, but it's really funny. I think Dubrez and Ferris had some great chemistry together, and it's just it's just it's a really like funny. It's just it's one of those movies where you're watching, and you're like, you know what, I really. Th- I really ended up liking that, so, um, yeah, I'm just gonna go with that. My next surprise of the year, which is probably my biggest surprise, this will probably be my top surprise of the year, Teen Titans Go to the Movies. Hands down, this is my biggest surprise of the year. I did not care for this movie whatsoever before it got released. I watched the original Teen Titans cartoon, uh, when it came out, and I had not watched any of the Teen Titans Go which was the new literation of the of the same cartoon with different animation style. I didn't watch it. But I took the plunge and I watched Teen Titans go to the movies. I think it was like a week after it came out in the middle of the day where there was no one in theater. It was just me and my it was just me and like a few other people in the theater. And damn did I love this movie. I really really liked this movie. I don't know what it was. It won me over the humor, the on the nose humor at that. The music, it's it's almost like a musical movie too because there's a lot of times where everyone sings. It just had me laughing throughout in the movie, throughout the movie. And I'll admit, I watched this movie. It's it's something I don't usually do for animated movies. I went to go watch it again in the movie theater. It was that good. I it won me over completely. It just I, I, I don't know. I just really liked it, and I've watched it multiple times since. I'm not gonna lie. It is, if it wasn't for the fact that I was not looking forward to this movie, this would be on my, on the official best slash fair movies of the year. But since I wasn't looking forward to it, I had to put this on the surprise movies of the year. Yeah, I really liked Teen Titans Go to the Movies. I really did. I don't know what it was. Teen Titans Go to the Movies, the best DC movie that came out this year. Just hands down. All right. Uh, I got two more surprise. Yeah, I got two more surprises. The House with the Clock in Its Walls, which was the um, the movie based off the book um, by John Belairs, and um, it's it was directed by Eli Roth. I wasn't expecting much from it because it was directed by Eli Roth, and I'm not an Eli Roth fan. But I went to go watch it, and I'm not gonna lie. Most of the the reason probably I went to go watch it was because they were playing Michael Jackson's Thriller, the remastered version, in front of it, and I went to go watch it, and and but. Uh, I actually ended up really liking the movie. It, it was really fun. It, it didn't take itself too seriously. There was, you know, uh, some sprinkle amounts of humor in there, and it just—I it, don't know—I just, I just really liked it. So it's—I ended up really enjoying it more than I thought it would. And then the last um, surprise of the year, Uncle Drew, which uh, if you had told me I would be end up watching Uncle Drew and enjoying it. I probably would have told you to step away before I slap you in the face. Even though that's probably a bit over the top, but that's probably what I would have done. That said, though, Uncle Drew, uh, it wasn't perfect, um, but I was highly surprised 
by the movie. I was especially highly surprised by Kyrie Irving's acting because even on their, especially on their all that makeup, he actually was very pretty good as an actor. I mean, it's it's kind of amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, I actually have been, ended up really liking Uncle Drew. I don't know if maybe it was the the experience in the theater because everyone was really into it. Uh, it just got me into it. But it was definitely um, it was definitely one of those movies that I thoroughly enjoyed this year. So, all right, uh, that's it. Those are my surprises of the year. But uh, let's move on to the honorable mentions of the year for the best slash favorite movies of the year for 2018. And on the Apocalypse, which was a a musical comedy set during a zombie apocalypse. Uh, I, I want to say it was from England, but I think it actually might be from... It's from that area. I, can, I don't know if it's actually uh, an English comedy or if it's an Irish comedy. I have to I have to look that up. I, I didn't I didn't look it up like I thought I did, but um, it's very good. It's it's it, it, once you hear the concept and you just hear it, if you hear the concept of it's a zombie musical comedy set during Christmas time and you're just like that doesn't interest me at all. I would say uh, put aside that and watch it because it's actually very very good. I went and bought the soundtrack afterwards because I really like the soundtrack. The soundtrack is really really good. So and in the apocalypse. Definitely one of um, one of the best movies of the year for me. Uh, the next honorable mention is A Star Is Born. I uh, was not interested at all in watching A Star Is Born, but I ended up going to watch it because I wanted to see what Bradley Cooper did uh, as a director. This is his directorial debut in the movie. I wanted to see if Lady Gaga could actually act in the movie because I know she had acted in other things, but this is kind of the first real big uh, acting job, at least film-wise. And she actually did really, really good. Uh, surprisingly, she did really, really great. Um, and uh, I, I hadn't really seen her act in anything else. I know she was in American Horror Story. I hadn't watched that season, so I don't know um, what her acting ability was. But um, I was, it was good. Uh, I will admit that the first half of the movie was really good. And the second half of the movie kind of dragged on a little bit. But... Um, I really liked that the soundtrack again to this movie was great. Uh, I don't think In the Shallows is the best song in that soundtrack. I think it's actually Black Eyes, but that's just me. I don't know. We'll see how uh, you feel about that. Uh, the next one is Bad Times at the El Royale. This was on my much my must watch list uh, the second it was announced. Drew Goddard, who had directed uh, The Cabin in the Woods, and the cast he just put together was was amazing. You got Jeff Bridges in there. You got John Hamm, Ashley Johnson, uh, Chris Hemsworth, uh, Cynthia uh, Invero. I think that's how you pronounce the last name. If I'm pronouncing it wrong, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, you got all them in there. Lewis Goodman or Lewis Pullman, I should say. Um, which I didn't realize when I watched the Bad Times at the Air Royale was the same uh, guy who was in Strangers Pray at Night. Uh, he plays the brother in Strangers Pray at Night, but in this one he plays. Uh, the whole the, the hotel clerk that's in the movie, it's really good. I, I really like I really liked it. It's probably just a tad bit too long, but uh, I really liked Bad Times at the El Royale. I think Drew Goddard did a really amazing job um, putting this crazy mystery thriller all together uh, himself. Uh, the next honorable mention is Black Panther. And it's really hard to believe that Black Panther came out this year, um, or last year, I should say, but it came out so early uh, last year that I think people forgot about it, but it's it, it's still a very solid movie. It does have its problems. It does. But it's still a game changer for the superhero genre, and for movies in general, probably. But I think the hype uh, surrounding it it was massive, and I think the fact that it's it was so successful and the way it was successful was what made this movie so popular. Moving on, Bumblebee. Uh, I know it came out relatively late, but I really ended up liking it. I, I didn't think I would, but it really was enjoyable. I think Haley Steinfeld, uh, who was the lead in the movie, uh, did a great job. I think um, the director, Travis Knight, who was the CEO of uh, Lenka, who does all the stop-motion movies like Kubo and the Two Strings, which that was actually his first uh, movie he directed. Bumblebee is actually his first uh, live action feature film he directed. Uh, I think he did an amazing job. So I I, uh, I really think that he has a, a big future directing feature film debut, uh, feature film live action movies. Hopefully, uh, next honorable mention: Crazy Rich Asians. Uh, again, I may sound like a broken record, but I wasn't really looking forward to Crazy Rich Asians. I had not read the book, 
but uh, and the trailer didn't really get me interested that much. But I was I was gonna go uh, watch it anyway. And you want to talk about groundbreaking movements like Black Panther, Crazy Rich Asians did the same thing, uh, albeit of course a different genre and a different audience. Uh, and I think Constance Wu is probably going to be appearing in a lot more movies uh, soon. I think Henry Golding, who played the male lead in the movie, uh, has a great future ahead of him uh, if he picks the right projects. So, kudos to them. Creed 2 was another honorable mention for me. 8th uh, Grade. It's that, and that one's one of the more kind of smaller movies that came out this year. And I, I knew very little about Eighth Grade actually before I went to go. It's one of those rare movies where, uh, one of those rare cases where I didn't watch a trailer, uh, and I just saw kind of the word of mouth, and I went to go watch it, and I really ended up enjoying it. So Eighth Grade, for those of you guys who don't know, it's about uh, about this girl played by Elsie Fisher, who. Uh, has a great again. You're gonna sound me. You're gonna hear me sound like a broken record here too. Has a great career ahead of her if she continues down uh, acting. She plays this uh, this character who's uh, just this awkward. Uh, she's a teenager. It's a, it's a coming of age story. She's in, obviously in eighth grade. Um, she's trying to figure out everything. She's trying to figure out boys. She's trying to figure out herself and everything else going around. And uh, she does an amazing job in the movie. And it's just it's just really. It's a great movie. It's full of awkwardness and self doubt, and and just trying to figure out what's going on. There's this very troubling, but maybe real. I, I, again, I can't talk about this for experience because I'm not a girl. But it it's just it, there's a scene near the end of the movie where you're just watching it and you're just kind of hoping that someone comes in and stops it, uh, or that it just doesn't go the the way you think it's gonna go. But uh, but yeah, it's it's a great movie, and I think it's it's just the fact that they put the movie on Fisher's shoulders, and the fact that she can carry it all the way. And I think this is her first movie, so major kudos to her for for just taking that and then just delivering it to the finishing line. So yeah, uh, eighth grade. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. Uh, first Man is the next uh, movie on the list. I know First Man is actually getting some. I don't want to say hate. But it's getting this very mixed reaction from from everyone, because there's people that really like the movie, and then there's people who don't. <laughs> I'm in the middle ground, uh, actually. I there's this restraint to Gosling's performance as Armstrong until he cracks, and it, it's those cracks uh, in in the performance themselves and in the character himself where it makes sense to why he's so restrained. And I know, I like I mentioned, there's a lot of naysayers out there, but uh, at the end of the day, I really liked First Man enough to put it on the list, and I really liked it enough to say that it is probably, or not probably, it is a very solid, great movie. I the cinematography is amazing. I know there's a lot of people out there that are complaining that they didn't get to see a lot of the stuff, but I think the fact that Chazelle decided to put the camera in the cockpit with the characters during it is. Is great, and it's a very tension film because of those movies. When when those scenes happen in the movie, when you're in that cockpit with the characters, and you see the camera just shaking around, you see everything just rallying around. It's it's very very stressful to watch, and I watched it on a, on a big screen. I actually watched it when I was in uh, I was in L.A. and I got to see it at the Chinese theater, and. It, they just blare the speakers in that theater like crazy. So uh, I was just I was blown away by the whole scene. So it was very good. All right, so next honorable mention, uh, Hereditary. Probably the most divisive movie of the year. Hereditary had a lot of people talking. And it's and this is the thing that and this is the reason why I put it on my list. One of the reasons I put it on my list is because everyone bitches about trailers giving too much away. And you can't say that with the hereditary trailer. Because the the, the hereditary trailer I will flat out tell you this right now the 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 trailer for hereditary for hereditary makes you think it's a different movie so if you watch the trailer and then you watch the movie it is two completely different movies and i think this is the thing that really bothers me is like people it's like oh they show too much of the trailer oh blah blah blah, blah. this is a movie that's giving you something and then prom it's promising you something and it gives you something else and i think that's kind of what people want maybe that's not entirely what people want but that's something that people have been asking for, sort of, and then they finally get it, 
And then they're like, oh, well, no, I didn't like that. Bothers me a little bit. I don't know why. Whether you liked it or not, whatever. Say, say what you will about the movie. The movie, it's a slow burn movie. And then by the end of it, you're just so, what the fuck? And there's just a lot of, there's a lot of what the fuck moments in this, in this movie. But um, I left that movie theater bewildered as everyone um and i just i sat down and i just like thinking back and i'm just like i i just don't know what to what to i don't know what to think it's just one of those movies where you're just like you said that i mean i appreciate what the movie did i, I like the cinematography i like the production design uh, of course the performances by tony collette and the little girl millie shapiro were were amazing it's just you know never has the 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 cluck ever been so so suspenseful you know um next movie is uh one of the other lesser known movies on the list it's one of the more independent movies on the list leave no trace it's they cut like a, a crap ton of the dialogue because they thought that it would be better just to have a quiet movie and not have to, so much dialogue so it relies a lot on the performances of foster and mckenzie because they're kind of the only two real character i mean there's other people in the movie but they're the, we follow these two throughout the whole movie and credit to them for doing an amazing job with the the little dialogue they have but also sorry my voice is cracking for the little dialogue they have but also for committing to just doing a lot of this through um what's the word i'm looking for body language it's a really great movie it's a very quiet movie and i think thomason mckenzie Again, um, sound like a broken record. Has a great career ahead of her, uh, depending on the projects she uh, she picks. So, leave no trace. Definitely uh, a movie you should keep an eye out for. Um, the next honorable mention, I have uh, just a good handful. I've had. Uh, like I should have mentioned at the beginning. Uh, I watch a lot of movies. If you can't tell, I watched over a hundred plus movies this year, and I tend to enjoy a lot of movies, a lot more movies than other people. So my lists always tend to be bigger. Uh, so I'm just going to rattle through some of these. Uh, Ralph Breaks the Internet, a sequel, finally a sequel to Wreck-It Ralph. I really love the first Wreck-It Ralph movie. That was another animated movie that I watched a lot of times in the movie theaters, more times than I care to admit. But uh, but yeah, Ralph Breaks the Internet was was on there. Searching, uh, one of the movies, uh, probably one of the best films of the year. It's a, it's a simple story. It's about a father, John Choi, who trying to find out what happened to his daughter. Uh, after she goes missing and it's just it's a it's a, the whole movie takes place on a computer screen on a computer monitor and the fact that they were able to pull that off was amazing for the entire runtime it's it's, it's an amazing feat on its own uh sorry to bother you uh, I want, you want to talk about uh divisive movies that's definitely one because it, sorry to bother you it's this great concept and you want to talk about the movie trailers uh, deceiving you, that's definitely one that deceives you, because there's this weird act, uh, or this weird twist in the third act in the movie, where it's like, what the fuck is going on? Uh, so yeah, sorry to bother you. Uh, the Favorite, uh, which came out, of course, uh, came out later this year, of course, Emma Watson, uh, Emma Watson, Emma Stone, uh, Rachel Weisz, and Olivia Colman, it, it's, it's one of those movies where you're either gonna like it, or you're not gonna like it, but the performances by Stone, by Weiss, and by Coleman will uh, will make it worthwhile watching this whole movie because they're they're very good in the movie. Uh, the Night Comes for Us, which is a movie that you can watch on Netflix. I love a good action movie. I love a good action scene, and some of the best fight scenes to come out right now are from the team of the Raid, and that is what this movie is. Reunites the Raid stars uh, Iko Uwais and Joel Thompson, and although uh, Iko usually kind of plays the lead in these movies, uh, Joel Thompson is actually Tal Slim, I should say, uh, is the lead in this movie. He plays a former gang uh, enforcer who broke his oath and decides to help a young, a young girl from his last hit. And Iko Uwais is on the the opposite side of everything. It is honestly one of the most brutal action movies that I've seen. The fight scenes in this movie are fucking awesome and it's just one it's just one of those movies where i'm just watching it and i'm just like how do they do that holy shit so it is if you're a fan of action movies you're a fan of fight scenes this one is definitely one you should watch the night comes for us it's on netflix go watch it all right my last 
two honorable mentions I got here are The Old Man and the Gun, which is the Robert Redford movie. is actually last acting performance in front of the camera. So very, very cool. Uh, it's very, it's, it's a movie where kind of nothing really happens, but you're okay with nothing happening because Robert Redford just, he just oozes charm every time he's on screen. And it's actually based on a true story about uh, Forrest Tucker. He's a, a, an elderly bank robber who just gets away with it for the most part. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, a uh, it's just, it's, it's worth a watch just to see Robert Redford on the big screen one more time. Uh, and the last honorable mention is Widows, of course, the movie directed by Steve McQueen about uh, the husband, the, the wives, I should say, of all these of all these husbands who fail to do a job. And it's, of course, they're they're led by Viola Davis, uh, Elizabeth Debicki, and Michelle Rodriguez are, are all great in the movie. Uh, Daniel Kaluuya from Get Out and Black Panther plays uh, a, basically a bad guy in this movie, and he's just it's. It's very chilling performance, him playing a bag. He's very good at it. So, yeah, you should go watch that if you haven't. Whew, this is why it's always better to have someone else on this podcast. Uh, so, uh, finally, the best slash favorite movies of the year for me. All right, I have quite a few on here, so I'm going to try to rile them off uh, like I have been trying to do for the last the last handful over here for honorable mentions uh so my first uh again all, everything alphabetical order best slash fair movies of the year the first one is a quiet place and uh arguably one of the biggest box office surprises of the year um it's it was co-written and directed by john krasinski who also acts in the movie along with his real life wife uh, emily blunt um, we also have a, a, a real life hearing, uh, hearing impaired, sorry, hearing impaired actress, uh, Millicent Simmons in the movie plays their daughter. Um, it's, it's just, it's one of those experiences where you watch the movie and you're just like, I can't believe they actually pulled something like this off, at least in terms, not just in, not just in terms of movie, but in terms of the theater experience, because everyone that I know who went to go see it, and I know when I went to go see it. The whole theater was quiet. No one was r- rummaging around. Uh, no one, you know, was you know talking or anything like that. It was one of those movies where everyone was quiet, and it was it's it, it. I don't think there was ever a movie that that I've experienced like that. And there's probably not a movie that can do that ever again. So yeah, Quiet Place, definitely one of the best movies. Definitely one of my favorite movies of the year. Definitely probably one of the best movies of the year as well. Uh, so the next one, Avengers Infinity War. I mean, what else is there to say about the movie? It, it's it, it's it's been a build up for the last ten years. What they were able to do uh, with everything, with the story, with the characters, with Thanos, who looked amazing, the snap or what, whatever they're calling it now officially. It's just it, it left. You want to talk about audiences being quiet? My screening of Avengers Infinity War. Everyone was quiet when the credits were rolling. Uh, they were just waiting to see what the end credit scene was going to be. So, so yeah, that's 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 all I really I can say about that. Uh, the next one, Black Klansman, of course, directed by Spike Lee, it is the movie about um, the real life, the real life uh, occurrence of a black police officer uh, infiltrating the uh, the KKK with the help of a white officer. Uh, the black officer in this movie, played by John. David Washington, the real life son of Denzel Washington, and the white officer was Adam Driver. Uh, it was great. the the, perform- the performances by Washington and and Driver were were really what put the movie over. It's just it's a really good movie, and it's a movie where you're watching it, and then they say some things that are like that's never gonna happen, uh, and then you realize like no, yeah, that's 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 happening right now, and that's kind of sad. Um, so the next one is Game Night. Probably my favorite, not probably, probably is my favorite comedy of the year. Uh, the next movie is Hearts Beat Loud. For, again, going back to the smaller movies of the year, uh, this was definitely one of the best ones that I saw. Definitely one of my favorite ones that I saw. Hearts Beat Loud follows a father, played by Nick Offerman, and his daughter, played by Kirstie Clemens, who form a band before uh, the daughter leaves, or is about to leave for college. Uh, I fell in love with this movie. I, like I mentioned with uh, Anna and the Apocalypse, where I bought the soundtrack after the movie, I bought the soundtrack for Hearts Beat Loud after I watched it, because it's, it's one of those movies that's, 
really good. The, the songs in this movie are amazing. The performances by Offerman and Clemens are great. You know, everyone thinks of Nick Offerman from the guy from Parks and Rec, but here he's 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 really great. He actually gives a, a very different performance that he's usually done or that, I us- that he usually does. So I really recommend Heartbeats Hearts Beat Loud. It's a touching story. It's an it's a great soundtrack, um, and it came out like in the like probably around the beginning maybe maybe close to the middle of the summer and it was always going to be one of those movies that was going to be on my best slash favorite movies of the year list since i saw it so my next one is if bill street could talk uh written and directed by barry jenkins who of course wrote and directed moonlight it's based off the book of the same name by james baldwin it's a touching heartbreaking story i didn't know too much about it to be honest it was one of those movies where i was like i'm probably just gonna go watch it anyway doesn't matter what I think it's about. Um, the film, it's definitely one of the best of the year, and it's all thanks to the masterful direction of Barry Jenkins. Again, the chemistry between the leads, Kiki Lane, who plays Triss, and like I mentioned, James, Stephen James, who plays the, the male lead, The store, and the story itself is great. And like I mentioned, I haven't read the book. I didn't read the book. I didn't know too much about what the movie was about. I just knew going in that I was going to watch it. Because it was directed by Barry Jenkins, it was getting a lot of buzz. It was getting a, a lot of uh, things, uh, great things, being said by people that I trust. And I went to go watch it, and, and, and the, just experiencing it was great. Um, I the, the performances, it just I can't say nothing but nothing but great things about this movie because it's truly one of the best movies of the year. Uh, the next movie on my li- the next movie on my list is uh, Isle of Dogs directed by Wes Anderson and returning back to his stop motion animation style. I really like this. I don't know what it was. I, I, I was never, you know, at, Wes Anderson is one of those directors where you either like his movies or you don't, and they're not going to be for everyone. Uh, the humor isn't the humor just, you know, it's really one of those just humors that you're either going to get or you're not going to get. And I didn't understand Wes Anderson at first, but I've really grown to really like Wes Anderson and his movies. Um, I haven't seen all his movies. I haven't seen uh, bottle Rocket. Uh, Rushmore and the what's the other one? Um, the uh, how what was it? The something unlimited. The the, the Darjeeling, Darjeeling. Uh, yeah, I think it's the the Dar the Darjeeling Unlimited. I haven't watched those. Uh, I watched all those other movies and they're really really good. So I, I just, I'm a Wes Anderson fan now. I'm just, I'm just gonna say it out there. Uh, so yeah, De- Isle of Dogs definitely go go watch that. I got probably four yeah four more movies on the list uh so the next one is mission impossible fallout uh somehow the mission impossible movies are getting better and better with every film uh i still have my gripes with mission impossible 2 but for the most part i i i enjoy it fallout is no different uh it feels fallout itself feels like a, a culmination of all the movies that have come before it it, it it also kind of feels like a more direct sequel to uh the previous movies the, all the other movies kind of stand on their own but fallout for whatever reason feels like a direct sequel to rogue nation a- and the stunts in this movie obviously are incredible from the from the bathroom brawl to the halo jump uh to the finale uh fighting on the the mountains and the helicopter chase it is fallout the the best mission of boss movie i don't know arguably it could be but I really, really liked Fallout. The chase scene, especially in Paris, all from the bike chase to the car chase, just amazing. It's just it's it's a great movie, great set pieces all around. I really, really liked Fallout. Uh, the next one is Roma, and this is a bit. It's a bit rare for me to enjoy, to like, or to love every movie a director has done, and Alfonso Cuarón now fits that that list he fits that bill Guillermo del Toro being the only other one that can come to mind at the moment the movie is fairly simple in terms of story it follows a middle class family where their maid uh, Cleo um, and their maid Cleo uh, living their lives in Mexico in the 1970s and the movie itself is actually a passion project for Alfonso Colón and actually based off someone he actually knew during his childhood that said though Roma is also actually set during a very important uh incident and that's probably not the word to use but that's the word i'm going to use in mexico during the 70s and i'm not going to spoil it if you haven't seen it or if you haven't read about it but it's based on it's set around something very very big that happened and i think because of that 
uh, and the juxtaposition, the juxtaposition of that and something else he uses, another big scene that happens in the movie, something that he does, the juxtaposition of those those two things says a lot. But um, what he was able to do, what Caron was able to do for the movie, uh, not only making it in black and white, but even the fact that it's in black and white and with the cinematography, the cinematography still looks amazing. You it probably be better with like all the colors and stuff, but the fact that it's it, it looks still amazing in black and white is a, a just it's a feat on its own. And the fact that he was able to do that is amazing to me. It is nothing short of excellent in filmmaking. Uh, and on top of that, the whole cast is pretty much unknown. Um, so kudos to him, and they all do very very well, even the child actors. So kudos to Corone. Roma is definitely going to be a movie that we will be talking about. Uh, come Oscar season, and if we aren't, uh, uh, shame on everyone, honestly, because it is one of the best well-made movies of the year. All right, uh, my last two movies on the list are Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, uh, arguably the best animated movie of the year, honestly. It's also arguably probably the best Marvel movie of the year. Uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, it, it's, it, it, it tells a story, of course, of Miles Morales, who is, um, the Spider-Man from the Ultimate uh, line in the comics. Uh, ask your nerdy friends about that; they'll probably explain it better than I do. But um, it, it, it it's it's truly a great movie overall. It really captures the essence of what it means to be Spider-Man um, better than any of the live-action Spider-Man movies have have done. Uh, the animation style is amazing. The emotional beats in the movie are perfect and spot on the score and the soundtrack are are all great it's just everything combined together puts spider-man into the spider-verse into a whole new level and it's honestly if i had to pick one of my favorite if i had to put three movies in my top if you had yeah if i had to do a top three uh movies of the year for 2018 spider-man into the spider-verse would be one of those three movies it is it is that good. It's it's funny. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, everything just works. Everything everything just works in the movie. I have nothing negative to say about Spider-Man to the Spider Verse. I honestly don't. All right, so my last movie is Upgrade. Uh, Upgrade uh, is probably gonna be one of those movies that people regret not seeing uh, on the big screen. It's it's a movie about uh, Gray, who's played by Logan Marshall Green. Uh, whose wife is murdered, uh, and the incident actually leaves him crippled. But a scientist comes to him and gives him a way to walk again through an AI system called STEM. And eventually STEM helps Gray find his wife's murderers uh, with a little extra help. And, of course, more stuff happens in that movie, but I'm not going to spoil it. Uh, and it's uh, Upgrade is directed by uh, Leigh Whannell, who wrote the first Saw movie. And he's uh, he's a very he's a mainstay with uh, James uh, James Wan, who directed the Conjuring movies and of course directed the first Insidious, actually the first two Insidious movies. Did he direct the third one? I don't think he directed. No, he didn't direct the third one. Anyway, uh, anyway, uh, Upgrade is uh, is definitely one of those movies that I was looking forward toward, and I definitely probably would have put it in my surprises of the year if I wasn't already looking forward toward it. And when else didn't disappoint? He didn't disappoint, man. He stepping behind the camera. He did an amazing job. The world they they created was great. It's it's the the action scenes in this movie are actually pretty good too. What they were able to do with like the upgrades uh, in the movie were were pretty creative. So I was I I just was blown away by it. It was it was one of those movies that I wasn't expecting what it was. I was expecting something else, and it gave me something else entirely. And I was very very good with that. I was very cool with that. Okay. Whew, that, that was a lot. I, I should have mentioned that I tend to have a lot of movies on my list. Although, if you listen to last year's best of, worst of uh, podcast, then you probably already knew that. But, uh, but yeah, thank you guys so much. I'm this. I said this might be a long podcast, so deal with it. Um, but uh, thank you guys so much for listening to this week's podcast. Like I mentioned, uh, the podcast is back. It will. It is coming back. Uh, I don't know if it will be a weekly podcast, but if it is, you guys will definitely know because it will pop up. Uh, it's going to stick right now on YouTube. Uh, I'm not putting it up on iTunes just yet. Um, I will be coming back to iTunes eventually, but right now the podcast is exclusively on YouTube for you guys to listen. Um, so 
Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. For all those of you who have stuck around, for those of you who are new to the podcast, hello, welcome. Hopefully, this doesn't drag you away uh, if you've made it this far. But uh, thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast this week. I want to thank Mike for uh, pretty much being on the podcast. I mean, he wasn't here with me in person, but he did uh, send in that that audio clip so um thank you mike for doing that and uh again thank you guys for listening uh if you want to go check anything out um for the podcast uh uh, everything is linked down below uh the facebook page for the podcast i'm gonna update it eventually uh the twitter page is also down there if you want to go check that out i'll be also be updating that frequently not probably as frequently as the facebook page because it's it's just easier for me to update the facebook page more than it is the twitter page but uh that's up there uh and then i believe i also have my instagram my personal instagram up there i sometimes put my movie thoughts up there as well uh my wordpress is down there where I do my written reviews, and uh, I'm going to be doing some some cool uh, lists and opinions and stuff on there. I have my most anticipated movies of 2019 list up there, uh, so if you want to go check that out, you can. And uh, I have some like standout performances of 2018, along with like my favorite fight scenes and my favorite trailers and stuff like that. So that's up there as well. I think that's it. I think that's all I got for you guys. So if anything else pops up it's going to be in the description slash show notes area so thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast this week seriously i'm i'm actually kind of glad that i'm back doing the podcast i think i don't think i probably will have regretted quitting and canceling the podcast but i think the break was really good um so i'm back i'm back and i'm not gonna say better than ever because obviously you will know i'm not back i'm not back as better than ever and i actually edit these podcasts so i know what i've edited out and i appreciate all of you for sticking around and for all you new listeners hopefully you guys uh enjoyed the journey of the podcast uh that's it thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast once again uh have a good day have a good safe fun weekend be good people and as always Go watch some movies. Woo woo! Yeah! Give it up! Movies!